Which is better out of the halberd, the bill and the glaive? It's Matt Eason here, Scholar Gladiatorius. So in this video, we're going to be comparing and contrasting the halberd, the bill and the glaive, which are three weapons which were hugely popular in the 15th and 16th centuries. They were really common and really typical weapons on the battlefield. Now, before I go on, I should just mention that um, obviously pikes and spear derivatives, including things like partisans as well and alspies and all these sort of things. So thrust centric pole arms were very, very important as well. But what I've chosen to do in this video, because I've been asked by various people under videos I've done in the past on pole weapons, what is the difference? What are the advantages of the halberd, the bill and the glaive? Because they occupy perhaps a similar role and a similar place on the battlefield. But before we get into the meat of this video, I want to have a quick word from our sponsors who are Raid Shadow Legends. Have you fought the Demon Lord or taken on the Ice Golem yet? Have you ascended the Doom Tower? Have you fought millions of players in the arena? Well, if not, then you need to get onto Raid Shadow Legends right now. There's a fantastic package here using the link in my description below or the QR code on the screen right now. And you can get playing Raid for free, free to download, free to play right now. If you've even heard of Raid Shadow Legends, then you know it has a ton of champions and badass bosses. It's got over 600 champions now. But let's look at one of the badass bosses, Sir Galaroth the guardian of the arcane keep. Unlike most of the other potion keep bosses, this dude's actually a pretty nice guy, sort of like a paladin, tasked with protecting arcane knowledge, so only the worthy can use it. Literally though, he is guarding arcane potions and he's checking to see if you're worthy of getting your hands on them. To do that, of course, you've got to beat him. He can be tricky if you're not ready, but he's one of the more straightforward bosses in Raid. His main mechanic is the basic attack. It deals a ton of extra damage to any champion without buffs. So your mission is to keep AAE buffs on your team at any cost. It seems easy, but it's complicated by the boss's left minion, which will strip all your team's buffs every time it gets a turn, so don't let it. Take that sucker out first or use control debuffs to keep it out of the fight. As long as you can keep buffs on your team, the boss shouldn't be too tough. Just bring a balanced team and buff your way to victory. What I personally love most about Raid is trying to get better times in the dungeons, and I love fighting other people in the arena. And this month, Raid has just released a huge new Doom Tower update. There are two huge new bosses to take on, Astronix, the Dark Fate, and Bummel the Dreadthorn. Along with new enemy balance on tower floors, new secret rooms to discover, and most importantly, new artifact sets to win. If that's not enough, the whole month is packed with awesome events and tournaments, including one very special event with a brand new feature, Super Raids. Super Raids lets you double up your rewards from hitting dungeons and massively speed up your progress. This is amazing for new players, and if there's ever been a great time to start playing, it's now, because you don't want to miss this. If you want to get a huge head start in Raid, all you have to do is click that link in my description below or scan the QR code on screen and you'll get an epic new hero, Chonaru, who's amazing in the Doom Tower. Also 200k silver, 1 XP boost, 1 energy refill and 1 Ancient Shard so you can summon an awesome new champion as soon as you get into the game. All these rewards will be waiting for you up here in the inbox and remember this is only for new players and only for the next 30 days. If you're quick enough you can even join my clan, my name's Captain Context in game. And it's that easy, free to download, free to play, go and check out the link below or the scan the QR code and I'll I'll see you in game. So thanks to my sponsors and thanks for sticking with me. Now let's get back to the main meat of this video. Now I am going to refer to uh, some degree to this book which is called Hafted Weapons in Medieval and Renaissance Europe. It's pretty much and it's by uh, John Wildman and it's pretty much the best book on this topic. I've cited it before. It's not that easy to get hold of and it's not that cheap unfortunately but it, there aren't many books on Medieval and Renaissance pole arms and this is a great book. Now Funnily enough, it's very well suited to this particular video because, as I said, we're not going to look at things like pikes and spears and their derivatives. In this video, we're going to look specifically at a comparison between halberds, bills and glaives. And those are three weapons which are covered uh, really uh, quite completely in this book. And they did, of course, come in various sorts. So not all halberds are the same, not all bills are the same and not all glaives are the same. Um, but we can compare them in general terms and I do believe that this is a fair comparison between these three weapons because I would argue straight off the bat that they occupied very similar places in the medieval and renaissance battlefield, fulfilled almost the same role as each other with minor details and differences in their designs and um, different strengths and weaknesses therefore. But primarily what dictated 
which one you used was where you lived. Um, so very generally speaking, the halberd was um, particularly developed in, we'll call it the German sphere, okay? And obviously Germany wasn't unified until the 19th century, but we can refer to the states of Germany all the way over to Bohemia and Prussia and uh, all the way across to where it butts up against France and also down into Austrian lands and Switzerland as well. And those regions, what would now be classed as Germany, uh, Poland, Czech Republic, um, Austria and Switzerland, they were the sort of homeland and uh, the, the, the kind of most favoured area for the halberd. Now the halberd is um, defined primarily by having a top spike. All of these have top spikes, okay? So very common for uh, pole weapons to have a top spike so that they can repel cavalry and stab with. Um, and, but the defining features of the halberd are an axe blade on one side and usually a form of hook-like spike on the rear side. Now there are variations in this and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in, in a bit, um, but primarily the halberd is defined by having an axe blade. Now, how's that different to a bill? Well, a bill has a couple of similar things. It has a spiky bit on the back usually, although not all of them do. It has a spiky bit on the top um, and that's pretty much normal actually for bills. Very occasionally you find a form of military bill which doesn't have a spike on the top, but usually they do. Um, but the defining feature is instead of the axe blade on one side, as we find in the German areas, German language areas, in, uh, on the bill, which we find primarily in England and Italy, although you do find it outside there as well, um, we find a hooked bill, a bill hook. Now this is, in its origin, this is an agricultural tool. So anybody who um, has a large garden or is involved with agriculture will be very familiar with what a bill hook is. You can come, you can get short ones, you can get ones on long poles, and they're for lopping branches off things. Now, clearly something that's good for lopping branches off a tree or a bush is gonna work on humans as well as a weapon. And this was the origin of that weapon. Similarly to how the ax in its origin was a, a tool um, that became adopted for war. So the bill and the halberd are actually really quite similar in function, primarily differing only in the shape of their blades. And we'll talk a bit about strengths and weaknesses of those two things uh, in a little bit. Finally, the glaive. So a glaive is essentially uh, like, and it has derivatives um, and other weapons, um, versions of it, um, sort of subsets of glaive, uh, which we'll look at some different versions of that have different features and different strengths and weaknesses. But it's primarily defined by having a long sword-like or knife-like blade on the end of a pole. All of these are on poles of similar-ish length, usually between about six and eight feet long. Um, so it's a long blade that therefore has incorporated into it a top thrusting spike. And very, very often, not always, but very, very often, it has a spike on the rear. Now, when we come to compare these three things, you'll notice that there are two elements which are very, very similar with these three weapons, and that is they usually have a top spike and they usually have a back spike. Now, there are some differences in how those back spikes are formed. Sometimes we find that they have more of a hooking uh, characteristic to them, and sometimes they have more of a, a beak-like or a spike-like Warhammer-like spike on the back. Now, clearly these are for slightly different purposes. Now, of course you can, an unarmored person, you can hit anyone with a back spike, okay? So if someone is wearing a uh, male or a gambeson, then hitting them with a back spike will stand some chance of going through their protective gear and wounding them, which is clearly a good thing if that's what your job is to do, is to go and remove enemy combatants from, from combat. Um, so, the shape of that back spike is actually quite important in how well it achieves that task purely by hitting. If it is more hook-like, it is not, generally speaking, going to uh, penetrate as well. Um, so in other words, if the rear spike is at an angle to the shaft and not perpendicular to it, then depending on the angle you're striking from, um, then it might not 
penetrate as well, but if it doesn't penetrate as well, it might hook better. Now, if a spike is sticking out at 90 degrees, completely perpendicular to the back of the blade, then clearly it might penetrate really well, um, but it might not hook as well, because when you try and hook something with something that's 90 degrees, there's a chance it will slide off. If it is a downwards curved uh, projection, then you're more likely to be able to hook. So, um, clearly in this scenario, having the choice between a um, essentially a warhammer beak for penetration or a hook for hooking and pulling is the choice you're going to face and that could apply to any of these weapons you could find something that's more hook like or spike like on any of these three weapons so they're similar in that regard um, now, if we talk about the top spike, again, we find different forms of top spike. Some top spikes are quite broad, um, so they're gonna do a lot of damage on a soft target, um, more blade-like, a bit like a thing like a broadhead on an arrow, while other top spikes are squarer and sometimes longer. Now, there's two issues here, maybe three issues, actually. One issue is reach. Clearly, the longer the spike is, the longer you can skewer someone from. And having a long spike far away from your axe head still means you can chop someone who's close, but you can skewer someone, for, or a horse, that is further away. So that has some advantages. And some halberds, for example, and indeed some bills, have a very long top spike far away from what we would call their center of percussion or their most effective chopping portion of the blade. Um, however, a thinner spike, whilst it might uh, be therefore lighter for its length and can reach further, makes a smaller hole. So if you go with a broader top spike, then it will do more damage to the target uh, if you penetrate it, but it doesn't reach as far. Okay, so we've got pluses and minuses there. There's another thing to think about, and that's durability. Okay, so a broader, shorter spike might be much more durable in a mass melee than a long, thin spike. A long, thin spike is more liable to get bent or broken uh, than a broader spike. So again, you've got to think about the pluses and the minuses here. In terms of the glaive, it sits slightly outside this point in that the top spike on most forms of glaive are um, part of the cup cutting blade. So whereas a bill, you can have your chopping part of the blade here and a spike at the top. With a glaive, the cutting part is morphs into and becomes the top spike. So generally speaking, the top spikes, you're pretty much limited to the shorter, broader type of top spike on a glaive, although there are some forms of glaive that do elongate that uh, top point. And indeed, there are some forms of glaive which have a separate point on the back. Now, this is a sort of exception uh, to the rule here. So, so far we've talked about a blade, a top spike, and a back spike. Uh, but there are some forms of glaive which indeed have the blade and the top spike, or sometimes just a blade, but then they have a back spike, so in, a back spike coming upwards. So what they've done is they've gone, okay, we've still got a projection at the back, but instead of having that back spike coming out laterally or perpendicular um, at the back to strike with, will come out, then turn an angle and come up with a top spike. You now have a blade here, a junction, or a, a kind of a, a neck coming out here, and then you have your top spike, so you have something to catch things in. Now that's a very interesting point, because so far, the glaive doesn't have much at the top to catch things in. Why would you want to catch things uh, at the top of your weapon? Well, quite simply, when you've got two pole arms coming at each other, if you've got some sort of fork-like device at the end to catch the opponent's shaft, then you can defend or you can offend with that fork. You can push their weapon down or push their weapon up. If the thrust comes at you, you can divert it with that fork. So having some sort of junction at the top of your weapon can be very useful. Now, if we look at halberds and glaives, you'll notice that we naturally get that junction because the junction between the top spike and the bill or ax sticking out at the side gives you that. It gives you the ability to do that. And we see this in the treatises. We see the use of this top junction used to defend or offend uh, and to push the opponent's pole aside. And incidentally, it's not just other poles. You could use this against swords or all sorts of other things, even potentially pushing a horse away from you as well if your point misses. Um, 
So there are some glaives which achieve that fork uh, advantage that the halberd and the bill naturally have by having the top spike as a, a junction coming out from the back. Now, something that's worth mentioning specifically about the bill here is that the bill, because of the shape of its chopping blade, is a bill. <laughs> so it's a bill hook. It has a hook on the front. Therefore, you could argue that frees it up to not need a hook on the back. It can have, for example, a striking spike, a penetrating spike for use against armoured targets or whatever. Okay, so if you don't need a hook on the back because you've already got a hook on the front, then your spike on the back can now purely become a spike. And that's one advantage we have to mention now. If we just compare the, the blades of the halberd versus the bill, you'll notice that the bill hook can chop or it can hook with the same blade. Conversely, the halberd has a primarily a chopping blade on one side and the spike on the back is very often a hook. Now, if we compare these two things, which is better out of those two? Well, clearly if you're holding the blade a certain way around, say with the bill, you've got your chopping blade forward and if you suddenly decide you want to try and hook someone, for example, you want to try and hook a pavis down or you want to try and hook someone's polearm out of the way, a, a pike, for example, or if you want to pull someone off a horse, then everything is in the same direction because with the bill, you've got your blade and your hook pointing forwards. So you can chop, you can hook instantly without having to do anything different. With the halberd, theoretically, if we just regard the axe blade as a chopping thing and the hook is on the back, theoretically, we would have to turn the halberd around to hook with the back. So on paper, that could seem like a disadvantage. But let me tell you why I don't think it's as big a disadvantage as that might seem. And that's because now if we look at the shape of the halberd blade, you'll notice that it projects out. And in most cases, not all, but in most cases, we have an angle at the bottom. Now that angle at the bottom of the, um, of the halberd axe portion can be used for hooking. Uh, so just because that is primarily a chopping blade, it doesn't mean that you can't hook with it because the, the hook at the bottom is naturally formed as a function of having the axe blade there sticking out from the socket. Right, so going back to the glaive now. So the glaive doesn't on paper seem to be as well suited for hooking. Um, and that might seem to be the case. That being said, we sometimes find side spikes on the um, socket of the glaive, and sometimes the rear projection on the glaive does have a hooking element to it. So clearly again, we see that these three weapons are similar. They all want to chop, they all want to hook or spike or both, and they all want to thrust and project at the tip as well. Okay, so they are really, really similar weapons. So what other differences might we consider between these three? Well, we could look at uh, thrusting power is gonna be the same between all of them. In the end, it's a point on the end of a pole. That's about the same. In this case, as we've looked at, hooking or spiking power is gonna be about the same on the back. So is there any difference in their cleaving power, chopping power, with their primary cutting blade. Well, you could argue that in many cases a glaive is going to have less uh, inertia uh, because it is a thinner, generally speaking, smaller and lighter blade. So the halberd and the bill are very, very comparable. They might be different shapes, but in terms of the amount of metal that's in a typical halberd, 15th century halberd and a typical 15th century bill, they're really quite uh, comparable and they're both going to be powerful, powerful choppers. So they're very, very similar. They're almost, you could say, the same weapon in different shapes. I know some people might hate me for saying that, but in terms of their actual function, if you had to take one of these, there's a halberd there, there's a bill there, and you have to go and fight in a battle in two hours time, you're not going to notice an enormous amount of difference between the bill and the halberd. With the glaive, more so. So it does potentially have less chopping power. But what does it gain for that? Well, very often they're lighter, okay? So a glaive, not in all cases, you can get heavy glaives and you can get light glaives, you can get heavy halberds and light halberds and same for bills. Uh, so there are exceptions here, but generally speaking, the, um, the uh, chopping power is gonna be less with the glaive, but the nimbleness usually is gonna be higher.
okay? Because it's generally speaking a narrower object than something like a bill or a halberd, um, and you can uh, absolutely um, cleave things with it, but you can do it more quickly. So it might be more nimble at dealing with certain types of opponents. It may arguably may be better against pikes and spears, which are very quick, uh, because they've got relatively small amounts of metal on the end of their shafts, so they can uh, come in with thrusts in lots of different locations. A glaive might be a little bit more nimble. Now, it's worth pointing uh, out at this um, juncture that, generally speaking, bills and halberds occupy a very similar place in the soldiery, in the soldiers using them on the battlefield, uh, used in similar ways. Even to the point that if we look at the treatises for their use, the way for using the halberd and the way for using the bill are very, very similar, basically the same. The glaive is a little bit different, and the glaive is arguably a little bit more like a partisan, and seems to have occupied a place that was more the role of bodyguards, so better suited perhaps to unarmoured environments, you know, palace bodyguards, civilian um, sort of law enforcement essentially and as a personal weapon, as an alternative to the Poleaxe. Now, the Poleaxe is a different weapon to the Halberd. It's usually shorter. It's got a different arrangement of uh, pointy bits on it and edged bits on it, um, and is more catered towards an armoured person using it against another armoured person or for personal defence. So it's a different type of purpose. And you could say that the glaive, depending on the specific type of glaive, sometimes occupies the territory of the... Uh, bill and halberd, but sometimes occupies the territory more of the partisan or the poleaxe. So sometimes it's for armoured people to use as personal defence weapon, sometimes it's for guards to use in a more civilian environment where a lighter and more nimbler blade might be uh, better. So, to wrap up, <laughs> The glaive, the halberd, and the bill are similar weapons. Uh, they can do similar things, but I would say that functionally, the bill and the halberd are very, very similar. Yep, there are some exaggerated forms of either. There are some exaggerated forms of Italian bill which have much reduced chopping ability, but really have a much accentuated hooking ability. That's fine. Um, however, I point out you can still kind of chop with those hooks, uh, but clearly the hook is accentuated over the chop. Whereas with the halberd, the primary, apart from the spike at the top and the spike in the back or hook at the back, the primary purpose is chopping. So clearly the bill is more catered towards hooking, the halberd is more catered towards chopping, but the glaive seems to sometimes occupy the same territory as the halberd and the bill, but sometimes occupies a territory that's more a personal defence weapon rather than a massed ranks weapon. And some of the glaives, certainly a lot of the glaives surviving in museums, are guards weapons and are personal defence weapons and are often very fancy for that reason. Not to say that bills weren't also sometimes guards weapons and personal defence weapons and equally halberds very famously were sometimes guards weapons um, and personal defence weapons as well and halberds come in a big variety, bills come in a big variety and so do glaives. But nevertheless I think broadly when we're talking about pole arms these three can be compared and they all with slightly different uh, kind of preference and a slightly different accentuation, they all basically chop, spike, hook, thrust. And so therefore they can be compared. I hope this has been thought provoking. Your comments and uh, like thoughts very much appreciated posted underneath this video. Um, I hope to see some interesting comments there. Uh, take forward the conversation. I'll see you back on the channel really soon for another video. Cheers for watching folks. Bye. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.